Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. They may be the fourth lowest in rate, but they're certainly not the fourth lowest in profit. How the state could save millions in the management of nursing homes. The scales m may not be responsible for the die-offs. The urgency to find what's killing a wetlands essential. I know that she is going to be strong and she's going to fight uh, this. Prayers and support mobilized for former Governor Kathleen Blanco. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on all those stories in a moment, but right now on the state we're in, a look at this week's headlines, which begin with the cancer diagnosis we learned this week about former Governor Kathleen Blanco. I'm in the fight of my life. Those are the words of former Governor Kathleen Blanco after disclosing publicly her battle with liver cancer. Governor Blanco released a letter to media outlets. She says, this will be difficult to win there is no known cure for the type of melanoma in her liver. A variety of treatments will be needed and she is asking for prayers. Prayers and support are pouring in from all over the state and nation. You may recall a few weeks ago, we showed you the reunion of former governors at the governor's mansion. Take a listen to what former Governor Edwards said to Blanco, words that seem to now have extra meaning. I don't ever pray for myself, but I never hesitate to pray for deserving people and I consider you to be one of them. Donna and I have been blessed to get to know Governor Blanco and her husband, Coach, and their family over the last several years. And we know that two things about her. She loves her God, and she loves the people of Louisiana. And she is such a strong person. And I had an opportunity to talk to her just last week, and she was giving me an update on the diagnosis, the prognosis, uh, and so forth. And, and I know uh, that the people of Louisiana will want to join their prayers to mine that she does have a full recovery uh, and that their doc, her doctors uh, will be guided uh, throughout this process uh, by the great physician. And, and uh, one of the, one of the uh, titles that we give uh, to Jesus, you know, and, and I know I had that conversation with Governor Blanco and, and I, I know that she is gonna be strong and she's gonna fight uh, this, but, but her faith is central to her um, approach to dealing with this adversity as it was uh, to her years as, as a public servant as well. I think this has probably been the worst year we've had at least in the last 20 years. That's Dr. Walter Kimbrough, president of Dillard University and a man who happens to be a national expert on hazing. Five deaths from alleged hazing events this year, including freshman Max Groover just two weeks into his college life at LSU. Kimbrough's candor shocked the Baton Rouge Press Club this week when he called hazing the unwinnable war and said that we honestly don't know how to solve it. He says even the shutdown of many LSU fraternities hasn't had lasting impact. University policy, he says, is eventually again broken. He says people decide to do what they want to do, ignoring any rules and knowing their decisions hurt the good of the fraternity. We talk about hazing exclusively as a college problem and more specifically a fraternity problem. But one of the studies out of the University of Maine indicates that 47% of high school students have experienced hazing before they get to college. So we're waiting way too late. My campus has anti-hazing workshops. Everybody does them. I speak at a lot of them myself. So I know I spoke at Louisiana Tech and did one for them a couple of months ago. So we all do this, it's too late. Kimbrough says conversations about hazing should begin by middle school at least, alongside bullying, because he says the facts show that hazing is happening that early. You can hear his entire speech online at lpb.org slash newsmaker. GOP House Whip Steve Scalise hasn't lost his competitive juices. 
He's vowing to return as the congressional second baseman after surviving a bullet. TMZ caught up with him at Reagan National Airport in D.C. Scalise battled for his life after being struck by bullets during a baseball practice in June. Massachusetts is the healthiest state in the nation, according to a new report from the United Health Foundation that looks at the healthy and not so healthy habits of people across the U.S. The 2017 annual report looks at 35 different factors affecting people's health, including rates of smoking, obesity, physical inactivity, low birth weight, drug deaths, and environmental conditions like air pollution. Louisiana ranked second least healthy overall and experienced an increase in drug deaths over the past five years, but in more positive news saw cancer and cardiovascular deaths decline during the same period. The Quota Club's recent Eyes on the Ties fundraising event at Lobert's Casino drew a near full house and saw an array of items auctioned, raising big money, including money for children's programming on LPB. On behalf of Quota International of Baton Rouge, it's my pleasure today to present a check for $43,000 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting to support their children's programming. This donation is made possible by the Baton Rouge community's support for our event Eyes on the Ties and also our major sponsor, the Baton Rouge Clinic. I want to thank every one of you ladies here. It was a wonderful team effort, it and we had all effort. of our education folks who helped here at LPB as well. Ladies, come on down, help me <laughs> a little bit. Isn't this exciting? Um, we're looking forward to kids' camps, kids' programming, and making kids ready for school. So we're so excited about it, and it is a great day, and it's it great couldn't day. be a better Christmas gift. Thank you so much. On Monday, the governor will outline his latest thoughts on the upcoming fiscal cliff. He'll be talking at a luncheon of business and area leaders. Meantime, there's hope that funding will come for the Children's Health Care Program, or LACHIP. Some solution has to happen by the end of the year, or it could put so many children out in the cold. That includes more than 120,000 children in Louisiana. If there's one thing that I think we can all agree upon, it's that poor children ought to have health care. Um, it's another one of those things that's informed by my faith, but, but whether you're faithful or not, I think most people can agree with that. And the CHIP program has been extremely successful and popular in Louisiana. And the idea that Congress can't get together and figure out how to reauthorize CHIP, uh, that's just awfully disturbing. Uh, and it is certainly at least a symptom of the dysfunction uh, that we are seeing out of Congress. And it is my hope, my expectation that in the next uh, couple of weeks they're going to announce that they have reached an agreement on how to do this uh, because I don't think the program itself uh, lacks support from Congress. It's how to pay for the program going forward. When state legislative auditors this month discovered that the Department of Health made payments in excess of 700 grand to Medicaid patients who had already died, it was actually an improvement from a previous such audit. Now, the previous one showed that payments exceeded $1.8 million over just two years to patients no longer alive. It is baffling that such mega mistakes keep happening, but it's not the only place auditors find big room for improvement. Same goes for the state's 260 private nursing homes that get Medicaid money. A November legislative auditor report says savings could be in the tens of millions of dollars. Senior producer Kevin Gotro investigates and gets reaction from the key players. If you're elderly and poor in Louisiana and need help taking care of yourself, the odds are you'll end up in a nursing home, since that's where the state's money goes. I think the national average is about 54, 55 percent spent on home and community-based services. In Louisiana, we spend about 37 to 40 percent. So about 60 percent is spent on institutional care. Karen LeBlanc is the Director of Performance with the Louisiana Legislative Auditor. Her office recently released a report on the Medicaid reimbursement rates to nursing homes. It notes that while nursing facilities' occupancy rate has grown by less than 1% over the last decade, their daily rates have increased by 
They've doubled since 2006 from about $112 to $170, whereas other providers tend to be getting cut, not getting increases. Medicaid payments to nursing homes in 2017 were just under $1 billion, around 10 percent of the state's Medicaid budget, even more than hospitals and physicians. To save money, the report recommends reworking nursing homes' Medicaid reimbursement formula. The rates in Louisiana are based on how sick the residents of the nursing homes are, the needs that they have, and that's called an acuity, the acuity level of a resident. So for the Medicaid rate, though, they take the acuity of all the residents in the home, including Medicare and private pay, and those are typically sicker residents, so that drives up the rates. So if we only included the acuity of Medicaid recipients, like other states do, then we could save about $19.7 a year. This move would require action by the legislature, and according to Mark Berger, executive director of the Louisiana Nursing Home Association, it would alter services. We believe that that decrease would affect our, the ability of our nursing facility providers to continue to provide quality care and also to improve on the quality of care. And quality improvement is something that our nursing facility operators are very much interested in. Berger admits that nursing home costs have increased over the last 10 years, but says Medicaid spending on nursing facilities has grown slower than overall Medicaid spending over the same time period. Plus, the rate paid is minimal. The Medicaid rate paid to Louisiana nursing facilities is the fourth lowest in the nation. I've been tracking the statistic for 27 years. Over that 27-year period, Louisiana's Medicaid rate is either the lowest or among the lowest in the nation. They may be the fourth lowest in rate, but they're certainly not the fourth lowest in profit. Andrew Mull is Associate State Director of Advocacy for AARP Louisiana. He says the annual cost for nursing homes is more than double that for community-based care, 46000 versus 18000 And despite state statutes favoring nursing home funding, that's not the type of care Louisiana's elderly residents want. Every survey we've ever done has shown that 90 percent of our respondents want to live at home. They want choices and they want to live in a setting that's um, in, that where they can um, uh, keep some independence and remain in their community. Plus, not all nursing home residents need to be there, Mull says. And what, what we know is, um, based on our scorecard that we did, 20 percent of nursing home residents are, don't require 24-hour day seven day a week care. Um, they could be living in their home and community. The alternative to nursing homes the state offers include waivers that provide light personal care, comprehensive care, and center-based services. But demand exceeds supply. According to the Louisiana Department of Health, there are nearly 29,000 people on the waiting list for its two most popular programs. The wait list for those options is several years. And unfortunately, what happens is because of the system that we've created and because we prioritize uh, the nursing home industry, what happens is folks who are on those wait lists usually don't live, along, live long enough to receive that care. The auditor's report also called nursing home quality into question, citing recent AARP scorecards. Louisiana ranks um, either last or almost last in a lot of the quality indicators. For example, we rank um, 51st, I think, for our residents who are on psychotropic medication. Uh, we rank, rank 50th for residents who have pressure sores. And then I think we rank 49th for, for residents who have to be hospitalized while they're in the nursing home. Michelle Aletto is Deputy Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Health. Her agency began a nursing home initiative last year, providing education to facilities on how to prevent pressure ulcers. It's seen promising results, as have efforts to reduce the use of antipsychotics. We were ranked nearly last um, in, in previous years, and now we've seen in the second quarter of 2017 a bump to 41st in the nation for the use of antipsychotics. So there's absolutely been marked improvement. We still think there is room uh, to improve on this, but we're, we're very encouraged. Berger says that the AARP scorecards give an incomplete picture of nursing home quality. Of the 15 long-stay quality measures that are tracked by the federal government, Louisiana meets or exceeds the national average in nine of those 15 measures, so nine of 15. Of the remaining six, 
we're sometimes within a tenth of a percent of the national average, and we're never more than three percent. Mall says expanding the state's Medicaid managed care population to include the elderly would help add balance to Louisiana's long-term care system. What that solution will do is it will incentivize um, more options and more choices for long-term care. So what will happen is we'll be able to, one, provide more folks in, in, a, in a setting that they prefer. Two, it will help control the spiraling uh, cost that long-term care currently is in, and it will also stabilize quality and improve quality for those receiving long-term care. That's LPB's Kevin Gotro. To see the full report, head over to the Louisiana Legislative Auditor's website. It's at lla.la.gov. Alarms sounded when one of our coastal wetlands' most important plants suddenly began dying off at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Rose O'Kane's dense root system is essential to keep soil from eroding. LPB's Kelly Spires has been on this story since the beginning. You're here with an update for us. Thanks, Andre. Yes, that's right. Since then, the Ag Center has hired a new researcher who is conducting experiments and doing a lot of field observation to find out what he can about a bug that they think is the culprit. They're calling it rosocane scale. These dormant looking shoots are the beginnings of new rosocane plants. They were collected from the mouth of the river. Hopefully they will hold the answer to a question scientists and outdoorsmen have been asking for over a year. What's killing the cane? Ian Knight is an entomologist with LSU. He studies bugs. We're gonna be subjecting them to uh, scales and other stressors to see if we can't replicate um, uh, so we get the same die-off symptoms uh, that we see that we see in the marsh. Vaughn McDonald is a biologist manager at the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. He says the cane is critical for the wetland ecosystem. About this time last year, uh, some of our staff down at Passalute Wildlife Manage Management Area at the mouth of the Mississippi River had noticed uh, the roseau cane had looked stressed um, a little bit earlier than probably it should have been. Um, so they, they just started looking at it and they noticed something on the plant that they had never seen before. Something they've decided to call a rosocane scale. It's an invasive bug that sucks out the cane's nutrients. It's never been here before. It's from China. Um, and since then, it's just been, you know, slowly building. You know, it's, it was isol in isolated areas at first and then it just slowly spread across the landscape down, down at the mouth of the river. Roseau is an especially hardy plant. It has some salt tolerance and a really dense root network. We've seen lots of um, carbohydrates that they store down there. And so um, generally, you know, a disturbance shouldn't really cause them that much trouble. You know, a hurricane blows through, rips up all the stems, they just grow right back. But this bug makes them less likely to rebound so easily. What we're concerned about is that these really high infestations of scales are um, reducing the amount of you know sugars and resources that the plants can provision down in their roots you know as they're you know you know pumping sugars down into their root system the uh, the scales are just sucking all that up and the bug is widespread i would venture to say that probably 80 percent of the roseau cane down at the mouth of the river is probably affected by the scale the thing is, scientists aren't sure if the bug is the main culprit or if it's just exacerbating the sickness of an already stressed plant. I, I believe that the, the high river does, could play some part into the how fast those plants green up. And that's the same time that the scale is impacting the plants too. The scales m may not be responsible for the die-offs. We, we really don't know, and that's part of the problem. There's, there's a lot of questions that still haven't been answered. One silver lining is that there are different kinds of rosocane at the mouth of the river. The dominant uh, variety in the delta, the dominant lineage in the delta, which we call the delta variety, um, is the one where we see most of, uh, was where we see the die-off symptoms. Uh, there's another uh, uh, variety, which we call the European variety, but we don't see the same die-off symptoms in um, the European patches. Knight studies bugs, not deltaic systems. So there are questions about the marsh that he can't answer. We don't know the full extent of the die-offs. We don't know how fast, you know, a stand affected with this die-off will retreat to open water. We don't know how they recover. Um, and we don't know 
really what the implications are for marsh stability. McDonald says they've seen other plants grow in Rozo's place. Another plant coming in now, it's elephant ear. I'm sure you've heard of that before. While you might think that's good, well, it has very little wildlife value, and it also doesn't have that the ability like Rozo cane does to trap and hold sediment because it's, you know, below ground biomass is basically a, a little a, a bulb, basically. There's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done, and we can only go as fast as the plants grow. The die-offs aren't really waiting for us to figure out what's happening. So Knight is doing lots of sampling at the mouth of the river to compare how Euro and Delta act in the wild. On top of that, he's waiting for the gathered cane to grow so he can replicate the system in the lab and learn how to treat it. We'll start infesting these guys uh, in probably about April once they get about this tall. Um, and we'll monitor them through the growing season, looking at scale populations, um, you know, indicators of plant health. But even then, he might not get answers. If we, if we can replicate it here in the greenhouse, then you know, we're, we know we're on the right track. Um, if it's due to the scales, then we'll have that data. If we can't get the die-off sy uh, syndrome to manifest, even with scale pressure, then it doesn't necessarily rule the, sc rule the scale out, but you know, it gives us um, reason to assume that there's other culprits in the die-off. And still, if the cane is dying because of the bug, they may not find a way to get rid of it. That's going to be hard, if not impossible. Um, it's not an agricultural pest, so we can't just spray it with something. Realistically, um, treating the scales with anything uh, doesn't really seem to help. We are looking at their natural enemies. There are three wasps present in the delta that are natural predators of the scale. So one of the hopes is that the system will work itself out. Scientists are in a holding pattern to see to what extent the scale comes back next year. In the meantime, they'll continue their lab work and field surveys. Andre? All right, Kelly, and you'll be following it. Thanks so much. Next week, a state we're in exclusive, my one-on-one -on -one interview with Governor John Bell Edwards. Louisiana's 56th governor reveals his biggest achievements since taking office and talks about his biggest disappointments. Here's an excerpt. Politico magazine in a recent article is asking the question if this governor can teach Democrats how to win the South. Can you? Well, first of all, my plate is full here and all of my efforts and energy are going towards being the very best governor I can be in Louisiana. Um, and, and we still have our share of challenges, even though we're doing much, much better. But I will tell you, at the national level, I'm distressed at what's happening uh, with respect to the political parties. It seems like uh, uh, the Republicans are moving further and further to the right, the Democrats moving further and further to the left. And people in the center of the political spectrum, whether they're independents, Democrats, or Republicans, increasingly believe nobody is really speaking for them. We're here at 7 next Friday night, December 22nd, so make plans to join us for a State We're In special, our sit-down visit with the governor. We take you now to the Louisiana Arts and Science Museum in downtown Baton Rouge. It's a Louisiana treasure of education and also simply a fun place to go. Here's Keith Dixon. The organization has been around longer than uh, we've been in this building. We've been in this building since the mid-70s. It is the old railroad depot uh, for Baton Rouge. In fact, at the north end of the building is a chalkboard train schedule uh, that you can see. It's really kind of neat. You can go to St. Francisville, you can go to San Francisco, you can go to Houston. So uh, a lot of places you used to be able to go to for Baton Rouge. Prior to being in this building, we were at the old governor's mansion. And then we moved here in the 70s, built an extension, uh, the art gallery, which we're in now. And then early 2000s opened the new planetarium and the atrium and the entire south end of the building. So the building has been through a lot and seen a lot over the years, even with just us being here after its days as a train station. One of our most popular galleries is our Egyptian gallery, which features a 2300 year old mummy. We used to think it was a girl, but we have since learned it is a boy. And it also features artifacts from the era and then in the connection of art, science, astronomy. There's information about stars and navigation and stargazing during the, the Egyptian period. And it really is probably one of the most popular things that we have here at the museum. We've had the mummy since early on, since the early 60s. And so it's been a staple of what we do and what we offer here. One of the unique things about the Louisiana Art and Science Museum is we do have changing exhibitions. 
Uh, we have a permanent collection, but in addition, our feature in our main galleries is usually a changing exhibition. They run anywhere from three to four months, and we'll bring things in from around the world, both featuring local artists, uh, featuring international artists, everything from a feature several years ago on Jim Henson to things about uh, colors and tapestries and the cartoons of uh, the Warner Brothers. Uh, so you never know quite what you're going to get. It's a great place to come and, and see something different every time you come. Our newest resident at the museum is Jason the Triceratops. He is 65 million years old. He shadows the mummy quite a bit. And uh, we've been fortunate uh, through a long-term loan from Todd Graves and Raisin Canes to have him here in our building. And it's allowed us to take our solar system gallery, which is a part of the planetarium area, and talk about dinosaurs, talk about geology, talk about how the Earth came to be through activity in our solar system from meteors, moon rocks, you name it. Uh, it really has allowed us to, to make some changes, but Jason's been a great addition to our our building. We are open Tuesday through Sunday. Uh, during the week we are open 10 to 3 and then on the weekends on Saturday we are open 10 to 5 and Sundays uh, 1 to 4. Uh, on the first Sunday of each month we offer what we call our free first Sunday. Anyone can come in and enjoy the museum uh, without cost and it's a great place to spend an afternoon. There's something for everyone. We've got uh, hands-on science activities. We've got great weekend programming from our BASF Kids Lab program uh, on the second and fourth weekend of the month to uh, our hands-on happenings on the first weekend and a great stargazing program on Saturday mornings for younger children, hands-on activities throughout the building. So there's always something for everyone. As he mentioned, there are a number of exhibitions ongoing, including one that begins this weekend, Star Wars, The Worlds Within. You can check the LASM website for more information. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.